Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, well, I, I can have I just have to move everything else. announcements. The uh, first one we want to talk about is this Tuesday at 6 o'clock on our basketball court is Trumpet Tree. So if you want to participate, it's a great way to outreach to our neighborhood and our kids. There is nothing but residential neighbors around us. There is a fire station next door. They do a lot of stuff on Halloween. They have a lot of kids that go there on Halloween just because there's free candy and it's a safe place. We're going to be people, there's going to be people probably walking up and down the streets all night long and we're going to be here with our trucks, our trunks open on the uh, basketball court, just trying to love on people and let them know we're here, that we want to uh, want to see them, we want to love on them, we want to pray for them. So if you are available, if you're willing, let us know. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, make some spots for you, and uh, we'll have as many people as we can. Just love on this community. Um, we want them to know that this church is here and active and wanting to uh, serve them. Uh, also, if this is your first time here, or if you're relatively new, or if you haven't filled them out in the past, we have connect cards in the back of the pews uh, in front of you. Um, so you can go ahead and fill those out. We would love to, to have those to uh, be able to reach out to you. We we'll to send out mass texts if we need to. If we have anything that's going on. Uh, on the back of those cards are our prayer cards. If you need prayer for any reason, um, or if you want to share what God has done in your life and you want us to praise with you, fill those out. You can hand those in with the offering, or uh, hand them to Pastor Hodge, Claire, myself, anyone. Um, also, those are the people you want to let know if you're going to be here for Trevor Tree. Go ahead and let us know. We can get you uh, put on the list. We can make spaces for you on the basketball court. Next, um, membership classes. There was one this morning. There's another one next Sunday at 9.30. If you're interested in being a member, what it takes to be a member of this church, and what that means, please come uh, next Sunday at 9.30 right here in the sanctuary. Uh, Pastor Hodge will uh, go over all that with you and help you through that. Uh, at the same time, in the fellowship hall, is not adult Bible study. Or Sunday school, it's a di adult Bible fellowship. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so worried about this morning. Um, that is Sunday's nine thirty. Uh, we're going over all kinds of stuff, um, to the confessional, to different cults, just trying to give you some more background on our faith in our church, and uh, just to equip you with with knowledge, uh, so you can go out in the world and share Christ, and also defend our faith with other people. Um, last thing on my list here is uh, Wednesday night discipleship groups. They are at 6.30 on Wednesdays over the fellowship hall. Uh, men and women separately. The men are not meeting this week, but the women are. And so if you want to come to that, that is a great time to meet other people in this church, um, have some fellowship. Uh, it's really big and it's really important that people here. And it's testimony night. Um, and I believe uh, one of the most amazing people in the world is giving their testimony on Wednesday. I'm not going to share who that is, but uh, my wife will be speaking. So, um, with that, did I get it all out? We good? I think I hit it all. Trevor Tree, let's go. Um, and the we, what we do here at First Baptist Church is we enjoy the act of reading God's Word in His house. And so not only is, is Hashi preaching out of this word later, we like to start our service by preaching out of the word. So as is our tradition, if you're willing and able, please stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 through 13. And I am cold reading this, so my pronunciations are going to be fantastic. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summon the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, and of Nahor, and they served other gods. 
And I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led, them, led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. And to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And I said, Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it. And afterwards I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers and with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come down, come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt, and you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who live on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel, and he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Bor, to curse you. And I would not listen to Balaam. Instead, he blessed you. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the leaders of Jericho fought against you. And also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, ooh, the Gergeshites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I gave them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you. The two kings of the Amorites... I was not, it was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. This is the word of the Lord. And as our worship team comes up, go ahead and have a greeting with a neighbor. Oh 
of God that the song that we just sang was Greatest Thy Faithfulness. And I was thinking as we were singing it, it was a bit of a slower rendition, and it's interesting that that song has so many different renditions, the faster, the slower, and I think it, it works well because sometimes that song can be sung in a faster mode, right? And greatest Thy Faithfulness, you're, you're excited, you're, you're praising God, and sometimes it needs to be a little slower. Greatest Thy Faithfulness, Lord, as you are waiting expectantly on that faithfulness. And we might think of the Israelites who were waiting for the faithfulness, and we see it in Joshua's day, as uh, Brian read today, that they may have sang that song a little faster. We read in chapter 24, and verse 13, And I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities which you had not built, and you have lived in them. You are eating of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. The message I'm trying to get across today in our offering devotional is how God is faithful and he has given you everything that you have. There isn't a grape that you eat that doesn't belong to him. There isn't a vineyard that you've planted which he did not first plant. And so as we come in this time of offering, think on that. What God has given to you in his faithfulness. Because we do not give out of compulsion, but out of freedom. For we are not under the law as of Moses, but of the law of liberty, the law of Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, I thank you for this day. I pray that you would bless each and every one of us as we continue to go throughout this worship service. May our sacrifices and offerings be lifted up to you as a soothing aroma through Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice was a soothing aroma for you. Pray that you would bless all those who would give uh, today in the offering. Bless the, the offering that it would be going towards uh, building your kingdom, however that may be. We're so thankful that you sent your son to die on our behalf, that we may live freely in this day of your son. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. As our brothers give out the uh, plates for collection, if you have a prayer request or a connect card, this would be the time to put it in. If you'll stand with us once more as we sing our doxology.
Good morning. Good morning. morning. It's great to be here to worship the Lord with you this morning and to to open up his word and study it and sing psalms uh, and great hymns to him. And uh, as is our, as usual, we're going to be continuing in the book of Acts. And so uh, if you do have a Bible, I'd invite you to open it to the book of Acts, or in Acts chapter 14. Uh, it is quite the uh, joy to be able to just go right through God's word and study it uh, and to, uh, to look at it and review it and uh, get to know it better together. And uh, it, is, it is just a joy. And I'm so uh, proud to be uh, y'all's pastor and to, to uh, care for your souls and have the honor to preach the word every single week. Uh, and, and help lead and, and worship with you all together. It's, a, it's quite the joy. It really is. and um, It comes with its burdens. It comes with its hard times. But I wouldn't trade it for the world. So um, Now, last week, we talked about a couple different things. We talked about the poisoning of the mind and how we must seek to cure our minds uh, from the things of, of the attacks of the enemy or from other people who would seek to poison those things, to poison our minds, that our mind is to be kept pure for God. And the other thing we talk about is that we have to keep pushing forward, just as the apostles kept on uh, preaching, uh, even when persecution arose. And so the way we keep pushing forward as a church is, uh, if you know this, this story, we went through some rough times over the last couple of years. And so we keep pushing forward as a church to impact this community and to grow uh, and, and to try to reach it for the better. And, and so one of the ways that we do that, that we have the opportunity to do that, uh, some of you already come and talk to me a little bit, is that, that we do our trunk or treat. We get to do little things uh, to outreach to our community. Now, uh, does the Bible say, hey, in order to help uh, your church do a trunk or treat? No, no, it doesn't. Uh, but it tells us to love our neighbor. It tells us to care for those around us. And, and this is just our way of doing that. You know, if we were in a different culture, we would probably do something else. Uh, and, and so, but this is the path in which God has enabled us to do this. I want to let you guys know, October uh, the 31st, the, this Tuesday, uh, we're going to be out there at 6 p.m. Uh, if you're going to be having your own trunk, I'm going to ask that you get there around 5.30. So we can go ahead and just get your cars parked in the right places. Um, that is going to, that's the, we're going to be parking on the basketball court. Um, we're going to be opening that up. There is a, uh, on the fire station side of things, uh, there is a gate that we're going to be opening where you're going to pull your car in. And then we'll park the cars there so that when people can enter and then they can just stay in the vicinity of the basketball court for safety and things like that. Um, and so there's going to be, I'm, there's going to be kids everywhere in our neighborhood. I mean, you could just, what Brian mentioned earlier, uh, we are in a residential area. We have the high school and the middle school uh, right down the road from us and the elementary school. And so I imagine we're going to get quite a few kids that are going to show up. We're also going to have hot dogs. Uh, so come hungry and you're ready to eat some hot dogs. I know Aiden's going to eat about six or seven. What was it, seven last time? It was six and Braden uh, eight is seven. And then he didn't get to eat anymore because we were helping Braden after he hurt himself. But it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We, Aiden can eat another. We can see how many hot dogs Aiden can eat at yeah. this thing. And, yeah. Um, I think that we should do that. And, 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 <laughs> and uh, I'm confident of who would win. It, will, it won't be me. It'll definitely be Aiden. Um, we got to, uh, I've had the blessing this past week to be on a retreat uh, with uh, Braden and Aiden and another a guy that we've known for a while. And uh, we got to go up to North Carolina, up in Asheville, uh, is where we were just north of Asheville on Mars Hill. And uh, we were up there on the mountain and just got to watch the sunrise and, uh, and just see the beauty of the, the sun coming over the mountains. And it just gave me this deeper appreciation for the Lord to see something like that. You know, we live in Florida. And I've always lived in Florida, so I'm used to seeing beaches and things like that. But when we go up to mountains, it's just something else. And and so it just gave me such a deep appreciation for the Lord. It was a great time of, of study and of prayer together and to just be able to have a good time of fellowship. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we're, we're going to be planning some other uh, retreats and events and things like that uh, moving forward for men and for women um, along the path. So keep an eye out for those. Um, but man, what a joy. What a joy in order to kind of have a little bit of a time together, a time to go see God's creation and go, study and go look at these things. Um, but let's get, go ahead and get back to our text. And before we get in it, I have a question. Um, 
And now some of you guys might have already thought about this question at some point in your life because it is uh, a question that uh, many of us will wrestle with and we'll look at and we'll, uh, we will struggle with a little bit. And that question is this. This might come out of the blue for some of you. Some of you might have never thought about this. What happens to the man who is on an island by himself and he has never heard, never had the opportunity to hear the gospel? Is he still condemned? Is he still a sinner? That's a deep question, right? It's a deep philosophical question. Well, in our text today, we're going to answer that question. It's going to come towards the end. Uh, but then my next question would be is that, do you think that God has revealed himself to everyone? Do you think that he has? Something else to ponder as we study today. Also, I also would ask in your hearts that you'd begin to uh, think about and, uh, and analyze your hearts, perhaps during this sermon, and see if you are fit and able to be partaking in communion after our last song today. Uh, we're going to sing Jesus Paid It All uh, to help prepare our hearts further, and then we'll take communion. So as, we're, as, we are, as I'm preaching today and we're studying God's Word, analyze yourself. Listen, and as we talk about different things, analyze, is this something that I need to turn from before I partake of the Lord's Supper? All right, let's go ahead and get into our text for this week. We're going to be in Acts 14, verses 8 through 20. And so as is our custom, if you would, um, I'd ask that you please stand for the reading of God's word. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. When the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so good. You are so good to provide your, your word for us to study and to read and, Lord, and to proclaim. God, I pray you'd be with us today as we study it and as we partake in your supper. In Christ's name we pray, the King of glory. Amen. All right, so we are in this place called Lystra. That's where our missionaries are today. Now, Lystra was like this rural mountain town. Right? They're up there. There's like this little village in the mountains is what I read is described as. It, it, it is this, it's not this huge city that we've been seeing them in before. Rather, it is somewhere, it's rural, it's quiet, it, it's small. There's not a lot of people. This is something to note here, that Paul and Barnabas, they didn't just go to the main central hubs where there's a bunch of people everywhere and all over the place. Rather, they did both. They went to both the big cities where they would have these big giant synagogues where they would go and speak or, or in a banquet hall of sorts, a meeting hall where people would gather and they would speak. No, rather, they would go to all kinds of different places. And one of these places is rural towns. They cared about the small town as much as the large town. They cared about every soul, no matter where they were from. 
And while something miraculous happens as they go, verses 8 through 10, Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. So there's a man who was listening to them, this man who was crippled. He would have been uh, left only to beg for food, to beg for money, to beg, and that was his whole life. Not being able to walk in this culture, this society, there's no at-home jobs that you could do without standing up ever. No, all these jobs were trades. They were trades. You had to be able either to make something, to harvest something, or to do manual labor for somebody. And well, this man, because his feet did not work, he's been crippled from birth, cannot do such a trade. There was no jobs where you can sit at a desk and type on a computer and put input information and do things like that. Most of the jobs were manual labor intensive. And so this man, for his whole life, would have been there begging, asking for assistance. He would have been desperate. It says this in verse 9, he listened to Paul speaking. So he's listening to the message that Paul is proclaiming. Paul, as we know, he says in other places, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 2, 1 through 5, it says this, And when I came to you, brothers, I did, not I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not plausible words of wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest, might not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What I'd like to point back to in that first Corinthians passage is back to verse 2, where it says that he came and preached nothing, he knew nothing except Christ and him crucified. That's first Corinthians chapter 2, by the way. So Paul came and he only preached Christ crucified. That was his main message. Paul wasn't going around giving TED Talks and trying to just say, hey, this is five ways to make your life better, six ways to improve your marriage, or, or three ways to gain wealth. This is not what Paul did. Paul went around and he preached Christ, which is what we are called to do. We are called to proclaim Christ. It is good to Perhaps look at some things and to study ways to improve your marriage. And, and of course, there is times for that. There's counseling for that. There's, there's small groups for that. But I believe that the main call of the pulpit is to preach Christ and him crucified. And what that does for our lives. This is why we do verse by verse preaching. Because all of the scriptures point to Christ. So he was listening to Paul, Paul preaching the message of Christ and crucified the gospel. And then what happens in latter half of verse 9? And Paul, looking at him and looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be well, be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and he began walking. I don't know about you, but if there was someone here that was crippled, that could not walk. And then suddenly, they were healed miraculously. If Braden's knee were to just come back together instantaneously, it would be incredible if he was to start doing jumping jacks in the hall right here in, the, in, in, our, in our little section right here. If he were to start running laps around the building all of a sudden, it would be miraculous. So you can imagine the shock that would have happened First of all, for this man. We're going to talk about the other part in a minute here. But I want to point out something. Is this can, can create confusion that's in the text. And, and it's here for a reason. And so we must study preaching the whole counsel of God. Verse 9 where it says, And Paul, looking intently at him, seeing that he had faith to be made well. Some would take this and, and say that, well, because of this story, and it happened in the book of Acts, therefore it's normative. I mean, it's going to happen all the time. They would take this and they would misuse it because they misunderstand it. And then they would say that, well, then anyone can be healed of anything if they have enough faith. Now, I'm going to say this. 
going to appeal to my personal experience, though I know it's not authoritative over the Word of God, and I know that there's value in personal experience. First of all, I'd say this, that if that were true, I know many people that are crippled and hurt that would be walking right now. Dozens. Next, I would appeal to what we've already seen. If you remember last week, we looked at them preaching their message, and it says they preached the gospel, and they shared of the hope of Christ, and then God granted wonders and miracles. And we talked about the error that many will have, that they think they need to go somewhere, do miracles, do wonders, so that the gospel then will have power. No, the gospel has power on its own. It is the power of God unto salvation. These signs and wonders were there to show the authority of the apostles. And the apostles were a blessing to that church. It was to prove that their message was true because their message has been proven true and their message has been put into words. I don't believe we have any more people that are healers. Right? Because what people try to do is they look at this and they say, well, there's people just as like Paul and Barnabas and things like that. They would call them apostles usually. They'd say, these people have the power to heal. I'd say that this is not true. For the healing had a purpose. It was a sign. It was an evidence. Today, the gospel doesn't need proof. It's proven in God's word. They, don't have, they didn't have the writings of the apostles then because the, the writing that we're reading now was being lived out. And so what we must understand when we see passages like this is and we ask, well, then what does it mean that he had faith to be healed? Well, I'd say this. He believed the gospel. That would be my argument. Some commentators have said, well, we can't really know what he believed. We can't really know if he believed the gospel. We can't really know if he trusted Paul of his power. But I argue that Paul probably wouldn't say that, but would probably then uh, direct his power and then point it back to God and say, no, no, why do you worship me? Why are you, you're going to see that later in this passage, why are you giving this credit to me? Give it to God. Now, don't hear me wrong. I believe God can heal anybody at any time. I'm not going to limit God. I'm not going to put him in a box. But this is what I'm going to say. Is many people like to abuse the scripture. And they like to misuse it. They like to take advantage of people. And, and so we must avoid these people. We must stay away from them because all they're going to do is bring harm. Usually what comes along with this is a lot of um, avoidance of the word. It's usually people not preaching about God, but rather preaching and advertising themselves. So, of course, this is what I'm going to tell you. If you have someone that's sick, if you have someone that's crippled that you love, pray for them still. Don't look at this and say, oh, God doesn't need to heal because he doesn't need to prove himself. No, there's dozens of stories and miraculous things that have happened that we have indeed seen that are proven. And of course, there's also fake things that people will stage. But God can indeed still heal. Now, this might even lead to the question of, what if I'm sick? Is God not healing me because I don't have enough faith? I premise it with this, is that all it says is we need faith of the mustard seed to move mountains. Right. Now, what if we have more faith than a mustard seed and God doesn't move a mountain or heal us? Does it mean that we didn't really have faith? Does it mean that God is not good? I'd say no, not at all. Everything happens within God's will. And this is where I would say I, I have personally known people that because of their illness or disability, they had a greater Christian witness than they would have without it. God might be using you or using that loved one you know to prove his glory to others. That is one example. We must always bring things to the will of God. And I also remind you of the goodness of God. There might be something happening. There might be a decision or something that you can't control that's happening, but you know God can change it. 
that he has not changed, this is what I would tell you is that you must remember that you have a loving father who is all sovereign, who can change it at any moment. And so there must be a reason that he's not. And that reason, whatever it may be, is the best reason possible. Story of John Piper talking about his mother. His mother was hit by a bus and killed. He was a young man and just beginning his ministry, and he was crushed. He loved his mother very much. And I remember listening to a sermon where he talked about it, and he said, I don't know now why this was the best thing that could have happened, but I will know. Mm -hmm. And so you have loved ones, and I have loved ones that have gone and passed away or are now on with the Lord that we really wish were here right now. Or we have people that are currently living with us that are sick, that we're asking God, God, why don't you heal this person? There is a greater reason why he's not doing it that you do not know yet and that I do not know yet. But we must rely and have faith and trust in the Lord that it is the right thing, whatever is happening. So we talked about this man's heart and how this would have completely changed his trajectory in life. That he's now able to get up and, and he's, he didn't just get up, he leapt to his feet. He's right on his feet. Of course, this would have been astonishing to him. Changing his future drastically. And so now you can imagine his reaction and now you have the reaction of the people that saw it. These people that Paul is proclaiming the gospel to. Acts 14, 11 through 13. And when the crowd saw that Paul had come, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconium, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker, and the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen, and garlands to the gates that wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. So in other words, what has just happened, these crowds have seen Paul and Barnabas, and they're like, oh my goodness, our gods that we worship are here in the flesh, and they're doing great things. They're doing these miraculous things. Let's go and sacrifice some bulls to them. Let's give tribute to them. Now you might ask, okay, why were they so quick to start Immediately sacrificing things and offering tribute. Well, if you read a little bit about the background of, of this particular town, uh, there is a legend in their town that Zeus and Hermes showed up and they did not offer a tribute to them. So then Zeus and Hermes called down a flood and destroyed the town. And so do you think this is out of reverence or do you think this is out of fright? They're afraid. They're afraid. They think, oh man, we're in trouble. We're not making this mistake again. Uh-uh, this ain't happening. Now I would argue, as we see in the book of Exodus, that any false gods that do any sort of thing is using the power of the demonic. I believe what scripture says. I believe there are indeed demons. I believe that these false gods and idols uh, perhaps can be real. Can appear and call themselves whatever name they need to in front of a group of people in order to achieve power. But we know that these things are actually demons. We read these in the rest of Scripture. And so these people, these things might have showed up and, and done something, might have destroyed the town, might have done something scary, or it might have just been a coincidence. But either way, these people aren't taking a chance. They said, uh-uh, we are not gonna get flooded again. Not happening. But now, why do they call them Zeus and Hermes? Well, first, Zeus, in the Greek pantheon, of which this is from, uh, would have been like the chief, you know, god, little g, god. Hermes would have been the messenger of Zeus to go out. And now this kind of leads, and as I was prepping this sermon, it made me start really thinking, and, and what, it, what it reminded me of is that I actually knew quite a bit about these uh, quote-unquote gods. I knew a lot about them. Now, why did I know about them? I knew about them because I went to public school. Anyone that goes to public school and goes through middle school, at some point, you have a whole section on the Greek pantheon. And thankfully, they call it Greek mythology. <laughs> now, I will tell you this, and this might shock some of you because of how ludicrous to you it will feel. I have met people that are my age 
that genuinely worship and believe in the Greek pantheon. Now, where do you think they have the root in this? I'm not saying we should burn down public schools. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that we should really think about what happens in our public schools. Because I can tell you something, is that we're sending our children to somewhere that is run by Caesar. And if you're sending your children to Caesar every day, Why would you be surprised when they come home as Romans? We go to school seven hours a day for five days a week. God's no longer in school. Right? At least they used to do prayers and things like that. That's cool. That's great. Now we have a government and a culture that is vehemently against Christ and his kingdom. That sees it only as a challenge. We have worldviews that are so far from what we have been taught, what we believe as Christians. And so this would be my question and my challenge and something to consider. First, the question is, is that does your child need to be in a public school? Do those you love need to be in a public school? Now, I, I, I see why many send their kids to public school. And I was raised in public school because simply private school is expensive. And sometimes homeschooling wasn't an option. Especially in a down economy where inflation is very high. I could imagine we're trying to send someone to private school or having to send them to homeschool would be incredibly difficult. Which then leads us to a final option. Is that send your kid to public school, but you have to make sure that you are active. That you are active as a parent in their life. That when you are with your grandchildren, you are active in your life to try to teach them about the things of Christ and his kingdom. What your children are around and what they're exposed to will shape the worldview. It will shape how they see everything. And so when they're in school, more often than they're at home, you have to remember, what do you have to fight against? What do you have to undo? Or remind us is that they might be here at church maybe twice a week. Let's say maybe two hours on a Sunday morning and an hour and a half on a Sunday evening. That's at most four hours a week. And then if you miss weeks and we have things like that, compared to the time that they would be in, in school or around a whole different worldview, it's so small. And so that's why we as parents have to be willing and able and committed to discipling our children. You can't just bring your kid to church two hours out of the week and expect them to become be full-blown Christians. It's family discipleship, family worship that, that, that pushes these things. You know, you might be saying, okay, well, my kids are out of the house and I, or I don't have children or things like that. Well, I'd say this, and then it takes a village to raise a child. Those of us who are here have a responsibility and we owe the youth of our church and of our community to be willing to pour into them. To be willing up to help raise up the next generation. Because we know that when they're with Caesar, they're going to be taught lies. So that's why many of them can get up here and talk about the Greek pantheon and probably know more about it than I do. Watch what shapes your So, Paul, Barnabas, being worshipped by these people, bringing them sacrifices, bringing them these, these tributes to them. And how do they react? Well, let's see what the text says. Verses 14 and 15 tell us. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. 
In other words, why are you worshiping us? Worship the one true and holy God who made everything. Why are you worshiping these idols that are made of wood that you made yourself? We're going to see this situation pop up a little bit later because they're, they're going to be Paul and Barnes getting in trouble because they're uh, hurting an idol-making business, actually. But what we see here is that most of these things that they would have been used to worship, you can go all over Greece and see statues of these gods. They're made by human hands. What kind of silly thing is that? To worship something that you made. But Paul tells them to do something that I think is profound. And I want us to look at it. In verse 15, the later half, it says, Turn away from these vain things to a living God. Something that is vain means it produces no result, that it's useless. These vain things were the false gods the people were following. And so now I'd ask you, what vain things in your life do you need to get rid of? What useless things are you looking at, observing, watching, following, that need to go? Maybe it's a pursuit of the material. Maybe it's seeking a higher paying job. Maybe it is, it is going and just the pursuit of the pursuit is what my father calls it. It's where you're just addicted to pursuing something greater. And that once you achieve that greater thing, guess what you continue to do? To do. You continue to pursue even more. It's like a thirst that can't be quenched. And to this, I would say we need to turn from these vain things. I'd refer you to the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, King Solomon, the richest man in the world, he wrote this. He put vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And through this book, he talks about all the things that he got to do, all the buildings he built, all the beautiful wives that he had, all the people that he conquered, all the great things that he did, and he talks about how it didn't matter because it was physical. And as you get through this book, the last paragraph, the last, the last pericope of this book, he says this. The end of the matter means this is all done. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Our professions and our possessions are temporary. We're not going to be remembered by them. Or if you are, you have a problem. You don't, want to, they don't, you don't want the people having dinner after your funeral and say, Uncle Bob was so great, or Uncle Joe was really cool. He had a really great car. Hey, can you pass the salsa? You want to be remembered of Uncle Joe or Uncle Bob or Grandpa, Gra Grandpa Ron was so cool because he really loved God. He served at his church. People went to him and cared about him. And when they had issues, they went to him. He was one of the most generous people I ever met. He'd give you the shirt off his back. He would care for you. He loved his kids. He was around them. He was available for them. He did a good job about raising us in the faith. That's what you want to be remembered of. You want to be the mother that is remembered for how well she loved her children and how she stewarded them as gifts from the Lord. It doesn't matter where you go in a career. It doesn't matter how high you get on that ladder. The vanity of vanities. It will all fade away. So focus on what is eternal. Turn from the vain things. And what did Paul tell them to do? It says, turn to the God who made heaven and earth. Turn to the living God who has control over everything, who can provide for you. Turn to him. And now this had a deep impact on these people or should have because as they hear it Paul is saying that their gods are dead 
Because what is the contrast between Zeus and Hermes and our God? He's the living God who made the universe. If you study Greek mythology, you'll see that this king of the god Zeus didn't even make the universe. What great of a god is that? He's not even the creator. He was made by something. How silly. But this God is the living God who is active, who has given us his word, that we would study it and that we would know him and know his heart. What a privilege it is, ladies and gentlemen. Psalm 99.1 The Lord reigns. I can stop there. The Lord reigns. He's king. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the chariot of them. Let the earth quake. We have a living God who is to be feared. Submit to the lordship of Christ. Hand your marriage over to him. Hand over your kids' lives to him. Hand over your career to him. Hand over your whole life to him, the king of kings, the king of glory. Hand it over to him. That's what Paul is calling these people to do, to turn away from the main things, turn to a living God. And this is what he says, verse 16 through 18. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet, he did not leave himself without witness. Now, what is this witness? God's let the nations walk, but what is the witness to him? For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. In other words, what he's telling them is that though God had not directly revealed himself to them in a, in a speaking way like he did Israel, what he did do was reveal himself by providing basically prosperity, food, weather, rains. He satisfied their hearts with food and gladness is what it tells us. And so this leads us to our question in which we open this message with. What about the little man on the island who hasn't heard anything about God? Well, I would tell you this. God has indeed witnessed to him. And now what would we call this? There's a big, this is a really long, 18-syllable theological term I'm about to teach you. Get your pens out, ready to write it down. Common grace. That one's easy to remember, all right? Some of these words I've heard, I'm like, I, I'm not remembering. I'm sorry. That's for writers. And for deep theologians. And I love deep stuff, but some of these names I can't remember. But common grace. Common grace. We can all remember that. Common grace is this. is exactly what we've heard here. That he provides rains from the heaven and fruitful seasons, and he satisfies our hearts with food and gladness. These people are pagans worshiping false gods, and yet God is providing fruitful seasons for them. You might ask yourself, there's all kinds of nations that are Christian nations, including our own. We have Christians in our nation, but I would say our leaders are not Christian by any means. Why would God provide good things for them? This is part of his common grace. Because he has preserved his church for himself. We are a blessing to the whole world, and he gives blessing on the rest of the world. Jesus makes a comment, kind of in passing almost, Matthew 5, 44 through 45. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We've heard that before. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words... It still rains, and God still provides food. He still clothes the people and takes care of them who do not believe in him. That is part of his common grace. We can enjoy different things in life because of common grace. This is like, for example, your cell phone. Perhaps not invented by a Christian, but God still allows us to enjoy them because of his common grace. Secular music we can enjoy. Because it's part of God's common grace that he makes people with the minds to be able to have the talent to write and produce something.
things like that. Now, there's some stuff we probably shouldn't be enjoying, but as a result of God's common grace. But at the same time now, how does this relate to the little man on the island? Well, this common grace, this provision, through his creation, is a witness. Romans 1.20 says this, For his invisible attributes, this is talking about God, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they... All the people of the world are without excuse. In other words, God through creation has revealed himself. Now, I'll tell you something and you might go, huh? There really are no atheists. There are only people who suppress the truth. Because we can clearly see creation Creation demands a creator. That is God's witness. Now, I will say this. This can raise a question in our hearts. Well, wouldn't it not be fair, Pastor, if someone doesn't hear the, if someone doesn't or has the opportunity to hear the gospel? Well, I would say this, that I would ask you a question back and, and, and say, does this person still sin against a holy God? All are under sin. This common grace, this, this general creation that we see is enough to condemn you. It is not enough to save you. Which then we ask ourselves, well, what about all these people who aren't going to hear about the gospel? Because there's no Christians in their nations. There can be. We can send them or we can fund them. This should drive us to want to tell people about Christ. Mm -hmm. Because the deal is they're all held accountable to God. This should drive us to want to help reach the unreached. By the way, that there's unreached all over our community. You don't have to go to the, the islands out in the Amazon. Sometimes it's the person right across the street. are all accountable to God. Well, they preach this message to them, and we see that the people don't really respond. They just keep offering sacrifices to them. Even after Paul and Barnabas have ripped their garments in a symbol of, of fear and of no, of, of mourning, these people still want to offer sacrifices to them. Verse 18, and with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. They couldn't stop it. And this is to show us that sometimes we might preach or share the best we possibly can. We might proclaim the gospel. We might share it. We might witness the best way we can. We might be the best Christians in front of them and might have the nicest little uh, display of the gospel that we can. And some people just aren't going to turn. They're going to stay following the vain things. It's just how it is. It's still our job to share and let God open their heart. We must always share, but sometimes they're just not going to turn. In fact, this happens. Verse 19, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, the places they just were at. And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. The enemies that Paul had followed him there, turned the people against him. I guess they didn't think he was Hermes anymore. And they stoned him. If you're not familiar with this, everyone takes rocks and they throw them at you. That's the simplest way to describe it. Until you're dead. It's not a fun way to die. It'd be very painful to happen, but we see they supposed that he was dead. They dragged him out of the city. They probably threw his body out there just to get rid of it. But it says this, but when the disciples gathered about him, so they come around him, he rose up. And what does he do? He entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. He got back up right after getting stoned and almost killed and went right back in. He went right back in for round two. You'll remember something we talked about last week is you've got to keep going. Keep being persistent. 
if Paul is persistent enough to share the gospel with these people and for them, them to stone him, how persistent should we be with others in our lives that need to hear it? They're not throwing rocks at us. Not literal rocks, right? The worst that might happen is they might throw a verbal rock at you and hurt your feelings. But what are we called to do? We're still called to witness. Now, don't be a pest. Sometimes you share and you just got to keep living like Christ around them. And then you'll get an opportunity to share again. And that still may not work, but then you'll get to share again eventually and just keep living and loving them just as God would. We talked about a lot today. And I've summed it down to three points because I'm a good Baptist. <laughs> that joke never gets old. First, we need to help, you need to help your children and those under your care develop a Christian worldview. We do this in many ways. Sometimes all it is you need to be that person that just hugs them around the neck and tells them that you love them and you care about them. Because that's the only influence you ever have in their life. Maybe you just get to see them passing here at church. I can tell you growing up, there was people that I avoided because they were not nice to me. Just because I was young. Don't be that person. Love these kids, man. Love these youth. And then parents, you have to work extra hard to raise your kids in the fear and the unconditional of the Lord. If you need assistance with that, I'd love to help talk to you. But I just encourage you to disciple them. Open up the Bible. Read with them. Worship with them. Pray with them. Teach them these things. They can pass it on from generation to generation. Next, turn from the vain things. Just as Paul called these people to turn from the vain things that were their gods and turn to a living God, we too must hold each other accountable and challenge each other to turn from the vain things, the useless things, and turn to God, to hand these things over to God and trust Him. Maybe today you need to trust Him. You need to hand over your career to Him. Maybe you need to hand over your finances to him. Maybe you need to hand over where you're going to live to him. Maybe you need to hand over your family to him. Turn from the vain things. And finally, all are accountable to God. Take this as motivation. Because some people, they might claim to be atheists, but they suppress the truth of the living God. They are living in the vain things. But this should just encourage us to want to share with our neighbors, to love the community around us. And maybe they find their way in here and hear the gospel. Or maybe it's simply they get to know you and get to have a good conversation. All are accountable to God. So that concludes our sermon for today. So what we're going to do is the worship team is going to come back up. So I invite you ladies back up. And we're going to sing Jesus Paid It All. We're going to sing an a cappella, so make sure to sing real loud. And while we sing it, we're going to think about the Lord's Supper. We're going to think about the Lord that gave himself for your sins and my sins. This is where I would remind you that this supper that we're going to partake in is only for believers. If you are not a believer, if you've not made a profession of faith, you not trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is not for you. I would ask that you please don't take it. In fact, the Bible tells us that you are bringing judgment upon yourself. If you take it, you're not a believer. And so if you have trusted in the death of Christ, that he died for your sins and that he rose again on the third day, then you may partake. If you have not, please do not partake. We're going to sing this song and then we're going to be around to pass these out. Jesus put it on.
taking your sin upon his shoulders and paid the debt completely. Christ was not kidding. He was not joking when upon the cross he said, it is finished. I will also remind you that this is a great time that if you have any sin that you need to turn from him. This would be the time in your heart to say, Lord, I hand this to you. I'm turning from this right now. And the moment that I take this supper, I'm turning from it. It's also your opportunity. I'd also remind you that there might be one or someone who you are not in unity with. When we take this together, this is a symbol of unity. If you're not in unity with anyone in this body or this body, do not partake. So let us take a moment to reflect and to analyze. Our Jesus, who paid it all. Representing Christ's body that was crushed for you and I. Take and eat. This is the juice representing the wine, representing the blood of Christ that was shed for you and I upon the cross for the sins of many. Take and drink. Lord, you have blessed us. You have given us a body of believers that we can fellowship with and take your supper with for your glory, Lord. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, that you took your wrath and poured it out on him, that he took the poison that was our sin and drank it to the dregs. There is none left for you. There is none left for me. Praise God. Lord, thank you. In your son's name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, and may he be gracious to you. Amen. You are dismissed. If you need prayer, I will be here after.